If you enjoy the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site, which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal, which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircrewinterview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. So Adrian, when did you first become interested in aviation? Gosh, well I guess that must have been uh, when I was seven. Uh, somebody took me to Barton Aerodrome, which was quite close to, to where I grew up in Salford. Um, but it looked really different to the back streets I grew up in. You know, it was all <laughs> grass and, and white picket fences and little white aeroplanes and things like that. And the people kind of looked different too. You know, I think everybody had seen up until that age looked like they'd just stepped out of a Lowry painting. <laughs> but uh, everybody at the airfield was all sort of pink-cheeked and happy and descending from the skies. So I think that's when I decided that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, so what year did you actually join the RAF? 87. 87, right, the year I was born, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a great year. It was it's, great. it's a brilliant year, it's a brilliant year. So, uh, obviously, uh, you went in as an air electronics operator. Is this what you always wanted to become when you joined the Air Force? No, everybody wants to be a fighter pilot, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, that's, uh, that's what I applied for. Um, but um, the RAF were absolutely spot on when they said, fighter pilot is not going to be your thing, mate. Uh, try this. And, you know, as I've got older, I've realised that they were they were absolutely correct. I would never have made it as a fighter pilot. And even if I had, I would have hated it. Um, it, it wouldn't have been wouldn't have been for me at, at all. So uh, I was quite happy with with what they they did come up with. Yeah, I think I've heard that quite a lot, actually. Like, you know, if you go for a whiz or roll or whatever, like aircrew, some of the aircraft, they always think, like, I'd rather be a good operator of something else than a, a bad fighter pilot. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, so let's talk uh, about some of your ground training and flying training and how long this took. Gosh, well, it's all a long time ago now, isn't it? <laughs> um, there was the initial uh, six weeks of... Uh, marching up and down the square and, and being gassed by the rock apes and that kind of thing um, <laughs> that everybody does. And then we went off to Finningley and there was a further seven weeks of um, of being beasted day in and day out. Um, and then they made you an acting sergeant, brackets right. unpaid, which is the important bit, the brackets unpaid. <laughs> um, and then you went into um, aircrew training, air electronic operator training. Uh, and that was just over a year, so about 14 months in total. Wow, that's that's quite a long time, actually. Yeah, there, there are two specialisations. So the, the first half, everybody's together doing the things that underpin everything. Um, you know, the, the maths and the science of it all um, and how the kit works um, in a very sort of broad brush way. Um, and uh, doing a bit of flying and that kind of thing. And then after that phase, you're streamed into what is known as wet and dry. So the wet man, the acoustic operators, uh, deal with everything below the surface. Um, so that's the sonar boys and, and, you know, listening out to the pings and that kind of thing. I wasn't quite odd enough to do that job. because <laughs> So I was, I was sent down the dry route, uh, which is radio, electronic warfare and radar. So everything mm -hmm. above water. Yeah, what did it entail? And uh, yeah, uh, I mean, like the systems like on the Nimrods, were they like high tech at the time? Because obviously it was a bit probably secret back then. <clears throat> yeah, they were they were they were very high tech indeed. Um, the radar was was the main piece of kit that you, that you were using. Search water radar um, and you could spot the snort of a submarine, which is basically six foot of drain pipe. You could spot that. 20 miles away. Craigie. Uh, you know, in the right in the right conditions anyway. Um, and you would because uh, obviously diesel submarines uh, have to occasionally pop a snort out of the water in order to run their diesel engines to charge up the batteries before they uh, head off again underwater. So that's what the snort 
And sometimes um, nuclear boats would want to come up for communication or, or whatever. So you'd, you'd see those masts as well. Mm. Uh, and so you'd you'd home the uh, the aircraft into that. They would probably dive and run away, but you would have that last point and you could drop all your sonar boys on it and find out where it was and where it was going and so on. So, so yeah. that was that was the anti-submarine part of it. Yeah. We also had an anti-surface part of it. And at the time, the Soviets still had a, a, a fairly big fleet. So we used to spend time doing that. Um, and there was also a search and rescue element as well. So we used to do top cover for search and rescue. And indeed, uh, we carried the uh, uh, dinghies and, and that kind of thing to drop to people if, if required. Yeah, so let's talk a bit about your flying training. And can you remember your first flight in the Nimrod? Because that Nimrod's iconic, obviously. My first flight in the Nimrod was actually before I joined the Air Force. It was as an air cadet. Right. Uh, we went on summer camp to RAF Kinloss in 1985, which was another fine year, but it rained a lot. <laughs> oh, it was filthy. <laughs> uh, and we were in tents. So it was, uh, I, I, I still remember that. Yeah, so I had, a, I had a trip on the Nimrod, which was about five hours or so um, on the Nimrod to to find out what they did, not really thinking I'd ever end up knowing any more about the Nimrod. (laughs) Um, And uh, and then, of course, I I ended up uh, on the Nimrod. Uh, Crew of 13 on the Nimrod, Mm -hmm. uh, in my day anyway. So two pilots, uh, one flight engineer, uh, two navigators, so you could get lost in two different directions. (laughs) Um, An air electronics officer who uh, looked after all of us down the back, and quite often, the navigator or the air electronics officer was the captain of the aircraft as well, rather than the pilot. Oh, okay. The pilot was just the driver to get us there, mm-hmm. uh, really. Um, and uh, and then you had uh, sensor operators down the back. So you had three wet men doing all the sonar boys and four dry men, one of them on radios and the other three alternating between radar and electronic warfare because you only did an hour at a time because it was quite intense work. Yeah, and was the Nimrod the only platform that could perform these roles within the RAF at the time? At the time, yeah, yeah. Uh, and obviously, we've now got the Poseidon, but that's very, very recent. Yeah, Adrian, let's talk about uh, obviously the systems on the aircraft. How easy were they, uh, you know, to get used to and actually manage? Uh, Fourteen months. To give you the clue, that's how long the training was. And you did 14 months uh, of training. Then you did uh, about six months on the operational conversion unit to the Nimrod. So training was at, at Finningley initially, uh, flying on the on the Dominey uh, and mm-hmm. doing simulator training for the search water and the Yellow Gate, as it was known, the electronic warfare kit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then down to St. Morgan for, for another six months or so on the operational conversion unit to actually get out and fly with the kit and start learning to use it tactically. And did the the Nimrod perform uh, one role better than the other, or was it just a mixed bag? It was great at everything. It was an incredible aircraft, an absolutely fantastic aircraft. As far as I'm aware, and somebody will probably correct me now, but as far as I'm aware, it's still the only four-engine jet aircraft ever built that could climb on one engine. No way. Absolutely. We used to close down the outboard two engines when we were out on patrol over the sea in order to save uh, save fuel. So we, we'd have just two engines running. And obviously, if you lost an engine, you still needed the ability to climb away on one engine. And a Nimrod could do that. And I can't think of many other four engine jet aircraft that could do that. And, you know, it spent its life, it spent 40 odd years bouncing around at 200 feet over the yeah. North Atlantic. Um, and so incredible that it that it lasted as long as it did. And there was a there was basically a Nimrod airborne all the time, right? Um, you know, the early seventies up until its retirement. So, what was it like a typical day like for y- yourself on the squadron? Were you flying every day? No, no, no. Um, you'd you'd get your flying program for well, you get your program for the next week uh, on the Thursday of the previous week. Right. Unless you're going away on detachment or something like that. So you really wouldn't know what was going to happen until the Thursday. And then you'd find out what you were doing the next week. So you might be you might be doing crew training. Mm-hmm. You might be being checked out by the standards unit. But you generally knew about that beforehand. You might be on search and rescue. So if you were on search and rescue, you spent a day on six hour standby. So you, you, were, you, were, you came into work in the morning and then went home in the afternoon 
and were on six hour standby in case of you were called in mm-hmm. uh, or you were on one hour standby which meant you were you were on the station at all times and um, you know if the if the siren went off you were out to the aircraft and airborne as soon as you you possibly could uh, to go out and do search and rescue um or you could be on uh, some kind of operational mission um and we did uh we did some anti surface stuff and and we did a lot of anti submarine stuff so you know looking for the submarines coming down through the greenland iceland u k gap and, and and all that kind of thing so would you like uh, train with the navy our, our navy like just to test yourself like how often would that happen that was that all the time that was happening right. all the time yeah both with surface ships and and with the and with the submarines um mm-hmm. you'd, we 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 were training you know, any time we weren't on an operational flight, we were we were out there training uh, to be able to do it, and with other navies as well. Okay, um, right, yeah. Other navies around the world and other air forces around the world. Uh, mm-hmm. I remember um, a lot training with uh, with German tornadoes. Ah, oh, brilliant! <laughs> My closest air air miss uh, was uh, <laughs> was with a German tornado. I was really? sat in the radio seat, which is on the port side of the aircraft, facing rearwards, um, and. There was a window to my right, and I looked out of the window and I saw the face of a German fighter pilot <laughs> in my window. It wow. looked that close, um, and I thought, "Oh well, we're dead then. I've got no time to tell anybody <laughs> or to I'll get the pilots to take any action. We're just dead." Mm-hmm. And I looked over to the air electronics officer, who was the opposite side of the aircraft to me, and looked out of his window and saw this tornado disappearing into the distance. So he'd obviously wow. seen us at the last minute and died. And it was kind of my fault that that happened as well, because we were we were operating tactically doing something and uh, using tactical communications. And I said to him, you stay. I think it was angels two and below. We'll stay angels three and above. And then we had that separation. What I'd forgotten that was angels was a code word we came up with in the Second World War. Precisely so the Luftwaffe wouldn't know what height we were flying at. Um, <laughs> so he obviously didn't know what an angel was supposed to be, which is his feet. Um, and so it just carried on anyway. <laughs> That's brilliant. And what was the uh, crew coordination like? Was there a lot of, uh, you know, uh, talking back and forth or were you just stuck on your job and that's all you're focused on? When you were on task, it was very, it was very uh, focused on the, on the job at hand and everything, everything ran on a process. Everybody knew what they should be doing as part of each individual uh, mm-hmm. tactic. Um, and obviously, if you if you were just bimbling along and you picked up something on radar and you called the fact that you had a, a contact on radar, then any chit-chat would stop and you would mm-hmm. be focused on on doing that job. Mm-hmm. And were you guys in the back, uh, did you have to wear born dorms? Because that must be quite uncomfortable if it, yeah, I had to wear born dorms in the back for that. <laughs> Those headsets. Just headsets, right? Yeah, much better. <laughs> and uh, yeah, let's talk about um, large exercises. Obviously, you kind of like mentioned it before, but have you ever worked on like you know what flew up red flag or anything like that? Big exercises. I think the biggest exercise I ever did was uh, was in Portugal. <clears throat> it's a lovely. If you're going to be on exercise, you might as well be on exercise exactly. in the summer in Portugal. <laughs> um, and uh, we spent three weeks out in Portugal uh, on a on a on a big NATO exercise there with the navies and the and the, the air forces of, uh, of of several NATO nations, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, flying alongside them. Um, I, I what I seem to remember most is flying mostly at night because the Dutch crews had a union and would only fly during the day. But I don't know how true that is, but that, that's what we were told at the time. That what that's why we'd got night flights. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was sort of the biggest exercise I was probably involved in. Yeah. And have you ever flown on like live combat missions? Um, no, uh, not really. I mean, we we did live missions against Soviet uh, submarines and, and ships. So, you know, we were going out to track Soviet submarines. We were going around to gather intelligence on, on the Soviet surface fleet. Mm-hmm. Um, but not really when anybody was planning to try and shoot me out of the sky. No. <laughs> um, it, it, we f- we went up when uh, the um, the Soviet Sovremeni was first launched and it had first been spotted out of home port mm-hmm. and we went and did a, a few flights around that to to gather intelligence and they did actually um, 
use the fire control radar to uh, to sort of lock on to us and that kind of thing. And I, I was listening to that at the time, but that was the closest I got to, to anybody actually trying to kill me. When it got dangerous and people got bullets and things, I, I, I left. Also, the actual subs could, they knew you were there? Oh, well, this, so Remini is a surface ship. Oh, okay, so, sorry, yeah. yeah. So we were, we were flying around that, and we're flying low around that, taking photographs. Um, mm-hmm. we had a uh, we had an agreement kind of that uh, we could do three passes okay and so we'd do three passes to get photographs if we did more than three passes then people started to get angry and things <laughs> but because the sort of remedy was brand new and shiny and had all sorts of kit on it they didn't obviously they wanted to dissuade us from doing just the, even the three passes <laughs> yeah and one thing i always remember just going off a bit uh, of top tro- uh, topic here is that nimrod is a loud aircraft from the air shows i remember it was almost like a fighter jet it was so loud yeah what'd you say yeah, yeah <laughs> very much yeah it wasn't it wasn't a great deal better inside i'll be honest with you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was just about to ask so was it actually comfortable for you um i i didn't mind it uh, okay. And there were people who suffered really badly with uh, with air sickness on the Nimrod. Wow. Uh, the Nimrod was based on the Comet. Yeah. Uh, so it became known as the Vomit Comet because down the back, I think it was the resonance between the four engines could actually uh, make people feel quite unwell. We had pilots who couldn't leave the flight deck in flight because they became unwell. Wow, really? Uh, and... Um, I had a friend who I went through training with who suffered so badly with air sickness that finally he went and it was an air traffic controller instead. Still is an air traffic controller. Wow, that's that's really strange. Never heard that before. And I, I thought it was like normally you get you get you know if you go through your training initially like oh you get air sick in like a Takano or something, but I've never heard in in a Nimrod or anything like that. I mean, you, they could throw the Nimrod around as well. I remember doing a. Um, it, if we, we used to dogfight with phantoms quite often. Um, as you do. <laughs> as you do, yeah, just for a bit of fun. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they had to send up, and somebody will pick me up on this, but it's absolutely true. They had to send up two phantoms in order to shoot us down. Um, because, you know, we were more manoeuvrable because we were a slower aeroplane, and it was a very, very manoeuvrable big aeroplane. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so they used to send up two in order to shoot us down. And I think, if I'm correct as well, I think eventually the RAF tried to arm the Nimrod with Sidewinders, didn't they? Uh, uh, we had Sidewinder from 1982. It was for a corporate for uh, for the Falklands. Uh, that's right. when Sidewinder was, was first fitted to uh, to the Nimrod. So it was a fighter. Yeah, was it? <laughs> World's biggest fighter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we had, we had um, Sidewinder, and then obviously we had uh, things like Harpoon, and we had um, uh, buckets of instant sunshine as well to drop on submarines and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I have to ask a question: I, anyone who's in like a multi-aircraft or crew aircraft, uh, was there an oven on board? Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we. I think my my longest trip was eleven hours fifty-five minutes or something like that. So, so yes, yes, there was an oven on board. Um, that was, they said that was the way not to be air sick, was to keep, was to eat faster than you could be sick. <laughs> and um, yeah, so yeah, we were rationed for, for all of the flights that we did. Uh, and when you went on search and rescue, there were compo rations. So, you know, the, the army type rations uh, um, on board the aircraft. And the, the, uh, the deal was as soon as the wheels were up, the rations were yours. <laughs> so it didn't matter how long the flight was, Brilliant. the rations. Uh, and uh, each crew had their own recipe for honkers stew, as it was known, which was just open various cans and empty oh, right. <laughs> and, <laughs> stew. Uh, and it, was, it was known as honkers. Uh, and, and every crew had their own their own recipe. And one of the crew bags, because uh, you'd carry lots and lots of bags on with codes and books and all sorts of things uh, but one of the bags always had uh, things like salt and pepper and paprika and curry powder nice. and things like that so you could make your own particular honkers <laughs> that's brilliant and you know like obviously these systems were really complicated that you were operating did like what was the percentage that they would work every time because like obviously these long missions that it was it just like control alt delete restart or how did it work they, they they were pretty good for serviceability. It mm-hmm. was very very rare 
uh, that you'd uh, that you'd have uh, unserviceability. And obviously on things like search and rescue, when it was key that you got airborne, you'd go out in the morning because you'd start at seven in the morning and do 24 hours through to seven the next morning. Um, you'd go out in the morning and you'd, you'd start it all up to make sure it was going to work. But there'd always be a second jet on standby just in case you got right. on board and something went. Yeah, but serviceability was was generally pretty good. And did you personally have a favourite mission the Nimrod flew? I always loved doing search and rescue mm-hmm. because you kind of felt that that was for real. Right. You yeah. You weren't practicing. You weren't. You weren't playing a game of cat and mouse with the Soviets or anything like that. You were doing something for real, and you'd, you know, you'd get dragged out of your bed at two in the morning by a siren, and you'd, you'd head off and and do the uh, and do the job, and then you know you'd come back and over breakfast you'd hear the the job that you'd been on on the radio and that kind of thing, and you knew that you'd done something worthwhile. You knew mm-hmm. that somebody was was alive because you'd you'd helped in some way. And what, like, so the the SAR mission was that like obviously not just for military, it was for the just the general public if there was a boat missing or anything like that. Yeah, it was it was mainly for it was mainly for for civilians and you know fishing trawlers way out to sea and things like. That. I remember um, I'm trying to remember what year it was now, perhaps ninety one or maybe ninety two New Year's Day anyway. So we were we were uh, we were duty SAR crew on New Year's Eve. And normally, if you're duty star crew, you go to bed quite early in case right. you were caught out. But it was New Year's Eve, you know, so we we stayed up to see in the New Year. And obviously, we didn't have a very small whiskey to see in the New Year. <laughs> we didn't do that. But if we had, we'd have felt lousy. Yeah. When when at um, and I, I'll never remember. I'll never forget. Uh, it said on my alarm clock, oh oh thirty seven. Uh, so I'd been in bed nearly two minutes when the siren went off. Oh we were, no. Uh, and we were out for 10 hours that morning um, and we did, um, I, I think we did a dozen jobs or, or, or so. It was, a, it was a horrible, horrible morning. Uh, there was a, um, a, a freighter, you know, with the, uh, with the containers on the back and almost all of the containers had been swept off by these waves oh. and, and half, of the, half of the wheelhouse was missing. And this great container ship, was disappearing behind waves in the way that a, you know a little fishing boat normally will. It was it was not nice out there. Um, yeah, so you know we would go out and we would locate them, and sometimes we would bring in other resources, be it uh, surface stuff or be it directing in the helicopters and giving top cover to the helicopters as well. And, um, or we would we would drop survival gear uh, to them if that was uh, if that was most appropriate. So you did you work with the Sea Kings much then? Obviously they got their, they had their the SAR mission as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'd um you know, if they were certainly if they were going way out into the Atlantic, we would we would give them top cover so that they um so that they had that little bit of uh, safety net. Uh but we would also often go and locate uh the 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 ship or whatever it may be mm-hmm. so they could go straight to it and we could direct them straight to it rather than them going to a rough area and having a search about and using up fuel and, and so on mm-hmm. we would go and locate it and direct them in to the exact location so they could do their wonderful brave fantastic stuff dangling on the end of a rope uh, and then we would watch them uh, go back until they could get fuel yeah, and I've actually talked to a few SAR guys, and they said like they've flown other like missions and stuff like that, and they always say SAR is the most rewarding uh, mission they actually flew, which is no surprise because you're helping someone who's in need directly need it now, which is great. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. You've, and you've obviously mentioned a few stories there before, but is there maybe one or two that really stick out in your mind you can share with our viewers from your time on the Nimrod? <laughs> There might be some that stick out. There's not. I don't know if there are that many I can share with <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with your viewers. Um, I, I think the the SAR mission that, that sticks in my mind most is is probably that one. Um, but there was one that we went to uh, a report of uh, a fishing vessel in trouble. And um, actually, it wasn't a report of a fishing. We were on a we were on a sneaky beaky going looking for submarines mm-hmm. mission. Uh, where you you know you take off and there's no it's complete radio silence and you don't have lights and, and yeah. all of that kind of stuff 
And we were out doing that. And um, our, our lead dry operator, um, uh, a, a chap called Master Air Electronics Operator, Mick Muttit, MBE, um, he, he had been in the Air Force uh, for 40 years at that point. Wow. Um, most of that in, in anti-submarine. And, and, um, and he heard on a radio somewhere that he was tuned into a distress call from, from a fishing boat. Right. Uh, and we had to make that decision. Do we carry on doing the secret squirrel stuff and perhaps let someone die, or do we just give it up and go and yeah. do the rescue? And obviously, it's life and death. We went and did the search and rescue bit, uh, and we spoke to the the, the fishermen later. Um, they were taken on water, and it was it was really quite a, a dire situation. And they said they were so far out in in the Atlantic that they'd given up all hope of anybody even hearing them. Wow. You know, they were, you know, these distress calls. And all of a sudden, out of the darkness, all these lights came on. And we had a, a huge searchlight as well. Yeah. And you know, all these lights came on and this Nimrod tore over the top and we came up on the radio and we dropped the life raft to them and they got into the life raft and were eventually rescued. So, yeah, that's one that, that sticks. Absolutely. And, yeah, who who makes that uh, decision, you know, change in mission? Is it like a, a collective crew thing or is it someone back on base? No, it's the captain. It's, it's right. the aircraft certainly in that case because we were on a mission where we couldn't transmit mm -hmm. so he couldn't have asked anybody is it okay is it okay to use the radio because they'd yeah. say well, you just have mate so yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. so it, absolutely the captain's decision uh, and in that case it was a navigator uh, was, was the captain of the aircraft and, and he took that decision brilliant but uh, yeah Adrian how many hours did you get on your Nimrod time I, I don't know. Uh, I didn't do it for for very long. I only did one tour because I damaged my ears. And yeah. So uh, about a thousand or so. 